Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to talk about four new awesome APIs coming out or have come out depending on when you're watching this video in .NET 6. Those are only four of the hundreds that are coming out mainly because those are the ones I will actually use and I'm excited about because they're solving problems I had in the past. Now, when I'm saying APIs, I don't mean like minimal APIs or web APIs. This is not about something you can call through an endpoint. This is all about the new classes and methods and all the goodness that we're going to use in our day-to-day -day code now using .NET 6 onwards. If you like the type of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell to get alerted when I upload a new video. So let's talk about the first one, which is now finally we have a natively built parallel dot for each async. If you remember in a previous video I've made in the past, I've actually talked about the lack of a parallel dot for or for each async. And the problem was that we had to actually synchronize the calls in those um, iterations because there was nothing we could do about this thing to be awaited within the context of the for loop in the parallel context. And as you can see here, we were uh, synchronizing it. By the way, if you haven't watched that video and you want to watch it, I'm going to put it on the top right corner of your screen right now to go check that. And then if you want, come back to this one. And what the alternative was, was first to use the when all version where you just throw all the call tasks on a when all and you wait for them to complete. This will utilize some sort of concurrency behind the scenes and it's pretty good. It's going to scale better than having this, which is heavily reliant on the part of your CPU, but it wasn't perfect. So what we did in that video is we actually wrote our own parallel dot for each async. And the way we did that is we still used when all, but we used a partitioner where we split basically the tasks to a number of pieces. And then we used the as parallel and the select uh, methods to try to be smart about how they would run in a parallel way, but asynchronously. And actually the results we got were pretty good. In fact, these are benchmarks I just run. And as you can see, the when all version is the slowest, but scales pretty well compared to uh, the parallel uh, dot four version, the synchronized one, which is twice as fast, um, but it's not that scalable. And it really heavily depends on your CPU. And then the custom one we wrote executes a thousand calls. And that's what all of them do, by the way, they execute a thousand calls to an API running locally over here within nine milliseconds. And it's pretty scalable as well. And now .NET 6 is coming out and it has a built-in version. So let's see how that looks like. This is the method we have here. And all you need to do, if you remember before we had the parallel dot for or for each, now we also have this for each async and it has basically the same API as before, but now it's awaitable and you can even have async and await in here. Now, let me just be clear on something before you could technically go here on this old method and say async and await. If this thing was actually um, returning a task um, that returns an end, so you can actually await it. So this would be valid code. However, this wouldn't actually await anything. In fact, it would actually turn this into a, an event and this would cause so many weird problems. So we did not have an async parallel. Now we do. And not only do we do, and not only does it have the exact same API basically that we're familiar with, with the parallel options and all that goodness, it also performs cliffhanger because I'm going to run some benchmarks now. So results are back and let's see what we have here. So as you can see, there's a bit of inconsistency with the results, mainly because they're calling something through IO. But generally, as you can see now, this parallel version that's built in, it's almost as good. Actually, it's the best technically, and I've seen it perform way, way better than the custom one we wrote with the added benefit that first it has the same API as an existing one, and also it's way smarter about its batching. Behind the scenes, it's doing something similar, but it's way, way smarter and more scalable. So if you want a nice scalable way to do PAL uh, operations now in .NET 6, you can do that with Forage Async. Really awesome feature. Now for the next one, we have the new Timer API. Now .NET has across all its versions, like five, and they're all kind of flawed in some way. So this new timer API called periodic timer, just show you here, new periodic timer is coming in to solve all those problems and make it very easy to have a timer, maybe in the background that does something 
um, on a repeated fashion. So here I can specify a time span and that time span is how often I want the timer to tick basically. And I'm going to say from milliseconds and let's do like, I don't know, every 420 milliseconds. And every so often I want to get something in the console. So what I'm going to do or what you can do is say timer dot wait for next tick async. And this does accept a cancellation token as well. So you can await that. And in order to do that, I'm going to turn this into an async task. Here we go. And you can say while wait for next tick async. And then I can say console dot right line tick. And then I'm going to just print the UTC time here. So I'm going to say date time dot uh, UTC now dot to string. Yeah, here we go. Uh, oh, here we go go and I can shorten that. So let's run that. Let's turn this back into debug and let's see what it looks like. So I can run this now. There we go. And you can say it's taking every uh, 420 milliseconds. Um, and that's a way now to do timers. And that's the presumably the proper way to do timers. Now you might say, well, my code will just lock here. What what's going on with that? How can I make like a background timer with this? Well, there's actually a few ways. First, if you're using a SPNet core, then you can put that into a background task. So create the class and then have the loop happen in that method in that I think it's called start or handle method. Uh, but you could also do something like the following. You can create a class, just call it anything. I'm going to call this background task and then you keep the timer task in that class in memory. And then you have a cancellation token source because you do want this thing to be cancelable. And let's change that again to uh, from milliseconds or in fact you can even parameterize that and give it you know a time span here so let's say time span um, time span or tick rate or just call it whatever we want and put that here and then it's going to keep doing that and then print the UTC now time and then you can cancel it if the cancellation token is invoked um, and you can call the stop method so from a usability standpoint you would do something like this you would say var um, background task. Here we go. Equals um, new background task, the thing I just made. And I mean, technically, I could also pass the time span in the constructor for this. It, model your API the way you want. It doesn't really matter for this demo. I'm going to say background task dot start. And I'm going to say time span from milliseconds. Um, and I'm going to say again, you know, a random number. And to prove that this is happening in the background, I'm going to do a write a read key here. So this will wait for a key input from me um, and the application won't exit. And I can, I mean, I would turn this into void because it doesn't need to be um, like this. And in fact, let me just do that. I'm going to quickly uh, debug this. So this could be void. It doesn't have to be. And as you can see, this is running in the background um, and the application is holding there. So when I do dot, so when I do enter or any key, the application is exiting. As you can see, it's not running anymore. But I can also do await background task dot stop async here. And I'm going to prove that it's running in the background again, because now I'm going to have to click twice, one to cancel and one to exit. So if I execute that again, as you can see all the way up here, this is now running. Now, when I press any button, I'm going to press enter. That's canceled. The allocation is still running. If I press again, it's going to exit, as you can see here. So that's just one of the ways you can use this new timer to do proper periodic timing in the background. This example was taken by a David Fowler post. I think it was on the issue of this periodic timer class. And it's a very nice way to just move away from those error prone old timer APIs of .NET. Now, the next API, and I mean, this was so, so, so needed in .NET because the only way you can do date or time in .NET is with a date time struct. So you would say date time equals uh, date time dot, and you can pass a date time, let's say 2020, um, January the 6th, something like that. And then you would be able to do console.write line date time. Uh, to bring again as the ISO version. And this, if I was to run this, would just, you know, print the full thing. But if I only care about the date bit, not the time bit, 
I can't do anything because as you can see, I'm getting the time as well. And I couldn't just say date only or time only. Well, now with .NET 6, I can. What I can do is I can say var. Actually, let me just explicitly show the type so you understand the difference. Date only. And I can say date only dot. And I can do the pause or pause exact or pause day number. But I can also pause for better compatibility with other code from date time. And I can say pause from date time. So I'm getting that. And you know what else I'm going to do in the meantime? I'm actually going to give this some meaningful time as well so we can see the next thing that I, I want to show you. So let's do this and let's change this to, um, I don't know, six hours and nine minutes. Here we go. And again, if I print that again, you're going to see that I'm getting both date time for something that I only want the date for. So now what we can do is we can say date and we can only get the date bit, which I mean, I don't know how many times I had to write code and I had to do some magic trickery behind the scenes to only isolate the date or just store the time for no apparent reason, just because there wasn't like a construct that allows me to only have the date. And in the same fashion, we can now also say time only because you might only be interested in time. So you can say time only. And again, you can instantiate time only if you want in the way you want with like an hour, six hours and nine minutes. Uh, or, um, I don't know, four hours, two minutes and zero seconds. So, so you can do anything you want with that. But again, for compatibility purposes, I'm going to assume that you have like a date time you want to extract that time from. So I can say from, ba -ba -da -ba -da. nope, that's not what I want. I want time only. Here we go. And I can say dot from date time. Here we go. And there's other ones. There's from time span. There's many of them. Uh, the donut team has done a great job to make this actually useful for existing code as well. And if I am to also print the time, you can now see that we can get it in isolation. Here we go. Just, just the time. Awesome. 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 Like I, I totally see myself using this on day one on some things that could really, really use just the date or just the time. Previously, you had to use something like know the time, uh, which is a John Skid um, time related um, NuGet package, but not many people use that. I mean, many of them do, but not all of them. So now all of us can actually be exposed to that. So this is awesome, really, really useful API. And now for the last feature in this video, it's going to be the wait async. But to wait, let me explain the problem first. So have you seen this dot wait method that people are abusing everywhere because they want to just wait until a task is completed in a synchronous fashion where they cannot use a wait async, which is not many use cases, but people still keep abusing it. Well, the point of using that method was that you could actually, for example, pass something like a cancellation token in it. And if that thing took a while, uh, then cancel it. Or you could also pass a timeout. So if we go and we see the API for it, let me just go into um, the decompiled code. As you can see, it accepts a time span for a timeout. It does call it a timeout. It accepts a cancellation token. It accepts milliseconds in a raw fashion and both milliseconds and cancellation token. And the point was you might have something that is long running like this slow call, which by the way, the code for that is in this project here. It will take uh, almost seven seconds for this to finish. So let's say I want this to uh, time out if it takes 4.2 seconds to execute in a, in a synchronous fashion, then it would look something like this. I'm just waiting here. And then in 4.2, the program exited. I did not get a response back from the API. It just exited early because it timed out. And again, you can do the same with the cancellation token. Now, we didn't really have this alternative in an async fashion, but now we have the wait async method, as you can see here. And what does that mean? Well, we can pass down either a cancellation token or uh, a time span. So I can say time span dot from milliseconds again. And now I can properly await this, assuming this is an async task. And imagine this as part of some like pipeline processing. And if something goes wrong or it exceeds a timeout that you've set or things are canceled, then you can invoke it through this new wait async. And as you can see now, it also properly throws the exception, the timeout exception, um, just because of the wiring with the whole async thing. And like 
you might actually even get the response back. So like if you, if you want to make it look like this, you can. This will just guarantee that this will time out or get cancelled. However, do you see, and let me just create a cancellation, cancellation token source here, because that's important, I think, to demo. So let's say we have a cancellation token, right? Now you can see that both the get await async of the actual call and the wait async method both accept a cancellation token. If I pass the cancellation token on the wait async method, then this doesn't guarantee that this call will be cancelled. In fact, it will be completed in the background, assuming it completes late. Uh, however, it will guarantee that the waiting or the awaiting for this call will be cancelled early. But the call might still happen in the background. You just won't know about it because your method execution stopped there. If you want to make sure that the actual async thing fails in the background as well, then you also need to pass the cancellation token on that. Otherwise, you don't guarantee that this thing will be cancelled if it can be cancelled. So make sure you understand where your cancellation token goes. And it's the same with the timeout as well. This might time out early, but in fact, behind the scenes, the call might still respond. We just will never know about it. It's more of a niche feature from most people, but I can totally see myself using it as well. And it's great that they've added it because now you don't have to worry about the sync method. Well, those are all the features I want to talk in this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making the videos possible. If you want to support me as well, you can find the link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe, more gonna like this and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.